Not the utility board here local. Got John Edmonds right here, he's also a journey lineman, and Kevin Whittington, which is also a journey lineman. What we got here is a demonstration trailer to do an electrical demonstration on primary voltage, on the same thing that you'd see that feeds power to your house. What we're doing is taking a generator back here behind us, we're putting out 240 volts, running to this trailer. On the front of this trailer is a transformer. The transformer is the same thing that feeds your house. A transformer will either step up voltage or step down voltage. In this case, we're stepping the voltage up from 240 volts up to about 7,000 volts on this primary wire across here, just like the power poles that you see outside. We come across the trailer, come to another transformer at the back, and then we step it back down to household voltage at 240 to 120 volts. There's a street light on the back back here that lets you see if the power goes all the way through. During this demonstration, we will draw primary arcs, We'll show you what it would look like if you were to dig into an underground utility. We'll also show you what kind of power that's in an underground transformer in an underground subdivision. A couple of times there's a loud explosion that will take place in this trailer. I'll give you a warning ahead of time if you'd like to stick your fingers in your ears. With that being said, we'll get started. So we'll take the trailer, we'll energize the trailer, and John will show you the voltage that's up there, show you that actually what it is. This meter right here is the same meter we use every day to check voltage before we do any work. So here we go, the trailer's hot. See the street lights lit up? We're at 7,300 volts up there. Right now, Kevin's gonna hook up the underground cable that comes over and goes into this green box. This would represent an underground transformer. Same voltage would be in there. It's, you're, you're fine, I'll give you plenty of warning. You don't have to stick your fingers in your ears yet. The reason we talk about this is, is we wanna make sure that everyone knows the number to call before you dig, which is 811 across the United States. Call three days prior to digging so that nothing would happen. They'll come out and mark a utility line so you don't dig into them. Also, the green transformers that are in the underground subdivision, a lot of the parents put trees around them, bushes, so forth, so on, or kids like to get on and sit and play. We want to let you all know that you don't want to play on those. You need to stay at least 10 feet away from that at all times because there is potential for electricity to be in there, 7,000 volts. This arc that we're getting ready to show you is what would be inside that transformer. The trailer's hot, hot. So that's what a primary arc looks like at 7,000 volts. Now, this trailer is pulling zero amp every time we start. So what you're seeing here is on the very bottom end of the scale. If we were out in the field, that would be about 50 times bigger than what you're seeing right here. We have to do that for safety purposes for the trailer. Who in the crowd knows what takes power out the most? What, what one thing do you think causes the power to go out the most? Rain, lightning, that's one. Yeah, that would do it. Number one cause, what do you think it might be? Can anybody see what he has on the end of that stick? An animal, the animal's good. Number one cause, the number one cause around here is squirrels. Squirrels come up on the transformer early in the morning like today because the transformer is warm. Just kind of like a dog laying in the sun. They get up there, when they go to leave, their tail comes around and touches the primary side of the transformer and blows the fuse. A lot of people think that the transformer blows and that happens, they hear a loud explosion. It's not the transformer that blew, it's the fuse. The fuse is there just to protect the transformer. Now this is one of those things I was talking about loud. So if you have sensitive hearing, you may want to plug your ears. If you will short the transformer, you'll see what happens, because it's hot. So that's what it sounds like when a fuse blows to a transformer. So what would have to happen is we go out, we come out and figure out what's going on. We normally walk up and there's a dead squirrel at the bottom of the pole, so we know what's happened. We have to refuse that transformer and get you back in service. So we'll talk about a Mylar balloon. We'll show you how electrical conducted a Mylar balloon is. If you were to be a child and you had a long enough string and get it up into the power line, it could run back to you and electrocute you. We'll bridge the cutout right here. You'll notice the street light will work and electricity will run around the balloon because it's hot. You can hear it, you can see it running around the balloon. See the light burning? What about kites? Anybody fly kites? You fly them out there in the backyards and the fields, right? Don't fly them around power lines? We're gonna show you how conductive a piece of kite string is. You'll notice John will bridge a cut out here, the light will light up, and you'll see the electricity around the kite string because it's hot. You can see it arcing up there. You can see the light coming on. It's very conductive. Now we're going to talk about tree branches or trees. 
anything that goes up to a power pole, whether it be a, a line or a tree branch, tree, whatever, we recommend that you stay at least 20 feet away from it because that energy will travel to the ground. So we've took and cut a little branch off right here. We're going to bridge this cut out and show you how conductive wood is. A lot of people believe that wood is not conductive. It isn't conductive in its driest form. But that requires a lot of time in a dryer to dry it out. So you'll notice the bridge with the cut out up here and the light will burn. So it's hot? Hot. See the light's not on? Look how bright the light got. Just a piece of wood. You see the arcing that happened. So again, wood is very conductive. What about aluminum ladders? Everybody got aluminum ladders? Everybody carries them this way. That's the way I stopped the carrot. My dad said carrot straight up. We have instances every year across the United States where people carry those extended to get into a power line, end up getting electrocuted. We're going to show you what a primary arc could look like with an aluminum ladder. The arcing will happen at the top up here. John will do a couple arc draws off of the line. So there's hot, hot. Now if you notice that flame up there is blue. Does anybody know what the heat started on? Yes, ma'am. Correct. Blue in the heat range is about 30,000 degrees. You notice how quick that went to blue, almost instantaneously. So it's going from the ambient temperature all the way up to 30,000 degrees that quick. That becomes an arc flash burn. That's what gets a lot of people whenever they get electrocuted. They get a burn that goes along with it, second and third degree burns. This is just a pool skimmer. Across the United States, people buy above ground swimming pools, put them in their backyards on a level spot, which is usually underneath the power line. They go and start skimming and forget about the power line and they raise it up and come into contact and get electrocuted. We'll show you how conductive the aluminum pole is because it's hot. Now again, we're at zero amps. Remember, if this was happening out there on the actual poles, we'd be 50 to 60 times more powerful than what you're seeing right here. We're at zero amps and what we normally, the power lines are normally running at about 20 to 50 amps of load on them at all times. Now we got a fire hose. We do this with the fire department and the firefighters to show them that the fire hose is conductive. It carries water to the inside of it inside of a rubber hose so they think it's not conductive, but the outside material will get dirty over time and anything that gets dirty or contaminated can conduct electricity. So we'll show you the arcing that happens on this. It will happen at the bottom because it's hot. That's what electricity looks like. You notice it's smoking at the top, the bottom is burning. We'll actually catch it on fire. They'll have to stomp it out over there. So next we're going to talk about a fireman's boot. A fireman's boot has a steel plate that runs from the toe to the heel of it to keep them from stepping on sharp objects in a fire or anywhere else they may be. The problem with that is, is that's a piece of steel. Whenever they poke a small hole in this boot, it's no longer electrical rating. It's only rated to 600 volts. We do this on primary voltage to show the firefighters what could happen if the truck become energized. They have a misconception that believe if they touch the truck because they have rubber boots on, they will not get electrocuted. Rubber is a very good isolator and insulator when it is tested, just like these guys are using. Their gloves, their sleeves. So the arcing here will happen at the bottom. So there's hot. It's hot. While they're setting up for the next part of the show, I'll talk about their gloves and sleeves. We test these gloves every time before we put them on. I'll pass one around here, y'all can kind of look at it. This is what we work with every day. So what we have to do before we get this glove is we have to do an air test. We take it and we roll it like this, and we listen for air leaks. A pinhole in this glove will kill us. This is what we use. This is what protects us. So we have to do that test. This glove, if you notice, has two colors in it. We also pull it apart and look for any cracking. 20% of the glove is colored is black. The 80% of it is red. When it wears a little bit, that shows up and we take it out of service. This glove is tested every six months at 20,000 volts. We have an on-site test facility at our location. Here you go. The sleeves that these guys have on are just for incidental contact, meaning that they brush against something. They can't use it to work on the line. We're going to talk about a down power line. Again, 20 feet is what we recommend that you stay away from anything that comes off of a power pole. The down power line here, the power line that we're using is, a, is the insulated power 
line right here. We're going to show you that when it's insulated from ground, it does nothing. But whenever it finds a grounding point, it will draw an arc. The same thing that would happen in the field if a power line was laying in snow, on some grass, in trees, on hay, anything of that, on a car. So right here, the trailer's hot. You'll notice that he's rubbing that around. It does nothing because it's isolated from ground. But when it finds its grounding point, Again, that's a primary arc at 7,000 volts. There is a thing called step potential. Step potential is just what it says was whenever you have it, two different potentials in your step. Step potential is like throwing a rock into a pond. There's ripples that come out from that rock when you throw it out there. The closer to the source of the energy going into the ground, the higher the voltage. The farther away you get, the lower the voltage. That's the reason we recommend 20 feet. We're going to do, talk about touch potential now. We have a Tonka dump, dump truck here. And the scenario is the guy was driving it and forgot to let his box down. He got into the power line. If he stays in the truck, he's completely safe. He's isolated from the ground. If he goes to get out and makes contact with the ground in the truck, he will be electrocuted. The same thing with the car. The car and the power lines they don't stay in the vehicle. So we'll energize the truck, show you that there is full voltage on it. And then after we energize the truck and show you that, we have a superhero that's going to come in and save the day. This is the same as a firefighter, paramedic, or the public coming in to try to rescue someone. We'll show you what touch potential would look like. So there's hot. You notice that we're about 10,000 volts. It's a little bit of a false reading. There's about 6,000 volts, which is more right. The paint gives us a little false reading sometimes. John will get set up here. We'll energize it again. Now notice that that light is burning on the trailer. All that voltage is there. It's doing absolutely nothing until John comes in and touches. Superman makes his contact, and you notice the arc at his foot and his hand. You have both. That's what it would look like if you come in and touch the vehicle that was energized. Again, if you're ever in a situation where you're involved in a wreck and the power lines are on the vehicle, stay in the vehicle. It's the safest place. Until someone comes and tests the line with a meter and drowns the line and lets you know. Don't wait for the fire department to tell you. It's usually going to be a guy like this right here. We're the ones that's going to do that. The firemen are going to stay away. If the vehicle catches on fire, you have to get out. And we recommend that you slide around facing out the door, open the door, take a small jump with two feet landing on the ground. Now, do not pick your feet up. Keep them on the ground and slide your feet to walk away from the scene. If you pick your foot up, that becomes step potential. The voltage goes in. Remember, the ripple comes out. So the voltage here might be 6,000. Here might be 5. Whenever you do that, it's going to be like a lightning discharge. That's going to run through your body, and the amperage is what's going to kill. Not the voltage. Remember, voltage burns, amperage kills. So now we're going to talk about our gloves. They're setting up a glove over here. They're going to take that glove and rub it on this line and show you that a good glove does nothing. Allows us to work on the line. And then they will take that same glove and poke a small pinhole in it. And we'll show you how quick it finds that pinhole. It's almost instantaneous. Brother, it's hot. You see, it does absolutely nothing. They're all good. Dead. He'll poke the small hole and that quick it will find it. So now he's poked a small pinhole in it. I'll energize the trailer again. The trailer's hot. That's how quick it finds that little pinhole. That's the reason it's so important for us to do our test. Now this is called a protector. A lot of people see us just like these guys. This is what you see when we're up in the air working on our hand. They think that this leather is what's protecting us. It's actually the rubber glove. The leather does nothing other than protect the rubber glove from getting holes poked in it. Everything we work on is sharp. The wire spray, there's staples, there's splinters, so we have to have this. We're going to show you that this leather protector does nothing against electricity. So there's hot. Just don't put your hand up inside of it. Look at the hole just blowed in. So now we're going to cook a hot dog. Who had breakfast this morning? Who has it? We, we take a hot dog because it's the closest thing to a human finger we can come up with. It has fat gristle, all that good stuff in it, sodium, salt. Electricity runs on the outside of a power line. 
Whenever you come into contact, it runs on the inside of your skin. It runs in your bone marrow, in your blood vessels, in the fatty tissue. We want to show you how it cooks from the inside. It cooks just like a microwave. So we'll draw a couple times for this and I'll show the crowd here how it looks. So it's hot. So it's warm to the touch. This is what electrical contact looks like. Just the same thing if I had touched it with my finger. Just that little small hole right there. That's two shots on 7,000 volts. Doesn't look bad, right? Everything looks good on the outside, but the hot dog's hot. It's cooked on the inside. For the moms in the crowds and dads that's had to cook these hot dogs in the microwave, you'll see how cooked it is on the inside. It actually cooks right down the middle. It's warm, the grease is running out of it. That's how electricity works. It runs on the inside of your skin, not on the outside. I'll show you all over here if you'd like to see. That's what the actual burn spot looks like right here. Just that little chunk of meat gone and it's cooked on the inside. Electricity runs in here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, lightning's a whole lot worse than what we're doing, but yeah. All right, we're gonna talk about generator backfeeding. We've been generator backfeeding down here, but we're gonna do it on a smaller scale. We've got a little 110 generator over here, real small. The scenario is the power's been out for a couple of days or a couple of weeks. The freezer's starting to lose its freeze and then mom and dad's mad about losing the cow that they bought last year, so they send someone down to the hardware store to buy a generator. They get down there and they buy an extension cord. They cut the female end of the extension cord off and plug it in an outside outlet plug the other end of the generator and fire it up. Never turn the breaker off, so now they backfeed the whole system, right? So we're gonna show you how much voltage that you can do that if you do that incorrectly. We always ask that you have someone professionally install an automatic transfer switch if you do a generator, just to protect. So we'll start the generator up. You'll notice that the street light will be burning. Street light's on, same thing in your house. We have the switch open going to the line. We're going to show you there's no primary voltage there. See there's no primary voltage. Kevin will close the switch in. This is just the same as that breaker at your house. Now you'll notice that there's going to be a lot of voltage on that line. So we're at 10,000 volts. The big generator back here that's putting out 240 volts is only giving us 7,000 volts. The 110 generator is giving us 10,000 volts. The reason that is, is it's in the balance, in balance inside the transformer. We're only heating up one side of the coils in the transformer. So the voltage is much higher. Now the problem with that is, not only are you supplying power to your neighbor, not a lot of amperage, but power. The child that's down the street that's playing next to the down power line that's been down for three days because we haven't got out there to clear it up, now is going to become electrocuted because that primary voltage is going to go all the way to that line to the ground. The next problem is, the lineman that comes out there, if he doesn't follow his safety procedures and he comes up and touches that line, he could become electrocuted as well. That's the reason when we pull up, it takes us so long to get the power back on. We have safety precautions that we have to follow. We have to test the line. We have to ground the line. If we hear a generator, we have to go find that generator and make sure that it's isolated from the line. Now with that, we got one more demonstration we'd like to show you. This right here is a meter can. It only has a meter in this socket. This is where we come and look and read your power reading for the month. In the past, people have tried to figure out ways not to pay so much for electricity. So they mess with this. They pull the meter out. They end up breaking the clips and causing a short. They get burnt from secondary voltage. Now this is the very, very small scale that we can do on the electrical side. This is 120 volts that we've made direct ground in here on a fuse. The fuse is about the size of a strand of a hair. Now this is another one of those that's a little loud. I will count down with my fingers and on three I will energize. So we'll pay attention inside the can. One, two, three. Again, that's a very small end of the scale. With that, that concludes our demonstration. We'll stand right here and answer any questions that y'all may have. Thank you.